make your mind light according to the standard of intellect microcosms can be divided into three broad categories dwarfs humans and devatas gods in our human society we find dwarfs in human structure we find humans in human structure and we find devatas in human structure what is our sadhana what is our inspirational practice sadhana is a march from the stratum of brutality to the stratum of humanity and from the stratum of humanity to the stratum of divinity and finally this divine man this divine entity becomes one with the supreme lord that particular point where the devatas merges with the supreme lord is the terminating point of all the marches in his life so it is a march it is something dynamic in human life one must not support one must not encourage the static principle dynamicity is the law and the order of human life you know in ancient times there was a great pandit his name was rohita he was well versed in all the shastras what is the meaning of shastra shas means to control to do shasana and tra means liberator that which liberates you by controlling all your activities don't do this do that through this sort of control is shastra it liberates you by auto suggestion auto suggestion means mantra incantation mananant trayeti astu sah mantra parikirtita a mantra is that collection of sound which when meditated upon leads to liberation so that rohita was well versed in all the shastras and after returning from his guru gra the master's house when his locket father asked him to do worldly duties he said oh i went through so many shastras and i have come to the conclusion that there is no necessity of doing any work we shouldn't do any work we should always be engaged in gyan charcha cultivation of spiritual knowledge then his father said o oh, rohita he who moves forward he who has developed the dynamic force in his body and mind is really blessed and the sweating body of that industrious man is the most beautiful body that perspiring body has world attracting charm and indra the lord of the devatas always tries to make friendship with that man with that industrious man so rohita move forward move forward move forward life is a dynamic force if someone does not do anything any work if someone is afraid of work then his fortune is sleeping if someone is intellectually and physically sleeping then his fat is also sleeping but if someone wants to do something then his fat also wants to move forward if someone is standing then his fat is also standing if someone moves forward then his fat also moves forward so rohita do something do something do something when you are sleeping in the slumber of ignorance there is kali yuga in your life if someone feels that he should do something there is dwapar yuga in his life and if someone becomes ready to do something there is treta yuga in his life and if someone has started doing something doing sadhana there is satya yuga in his life so rohita do something do something life is a constant effort to restore an unstable equilibrium life is a fight life is moving forward life is a dynamic force so this human life is a movement from the stage of brute to the stratum of humanity and from the stratum of humanity to the stratum of divinity and from the stage of divinity to merge with the supreme lord 
दिस इज लाइफ दिस इज योर इंस्पिरेशनल प्रैक्टिस दिस इज योर साधना बट यू नो वेन यू हैव टू मूव फैस्ट योर माइंड शुड बी लाइट इफ द माइंड इज हैवी इट विल नॉट बी एबल टू मूव फैस्ट वॉट मेक्स द माइंड हैवी सो मेनी इम्प्योरिटीज ऑफ थॉट लॉर्ड बुद्धा से रिमूव ऑल द वॉटर फ्रॉम द बोट ऑफ योर बॉडी बींग फ्री फ्रॉम वॉटर इट विल बिकम वेरी लाइट गिव अप एवरी थिंग दैट लाइज अहेड एवरी थिंग दैट लाइज बिहाइंड एंड एवरी थिंग दैट लाइज इन द मिडल एंड गो टू द अदर साइड ऑफ द वर्ल्ड यू शुड मेक योर माइंड लाइट यू शुड गिव अप ऑल वर्ल्डली थाट्स ऑल बेस्ट थाट ऑल डिपेरेविंग थाट्स एंड मेक योर सेल्फ लाइट To make oneself light means to free oneself from impurities. A magnet can easily attract a piece of iron, but if that piece of iron is full of impurities, that very magnet may not be able to attract that iron. So the supreme self, supreme Lord is always attracting you, but because of your heaviness due to worldly impurities, you are not being attracted by him. now how to free the mind how to make the mind light how to free the mind from worldly impurities by rendering selfless service to suffering humanity without any restriction of caste creed religion or sex so you as a sadhaka spiritual aspirant you must remember that the dharma of your life is to move forward from matter to abstract from abstract to soul from soul to the supreme soul this is the dharma of your life and while performing this dharma you are to render selfless service to all humanity you must not forget this fact if you are successful in rendering selfless service to the world certainly you will make progress in your spiritual life subham astu मे इट बी ऑस्पिशियस श्री श्री आनंद मूर्ति जी परम पिता बाबा की जय द फील्ड ऑफ धर्म यू नो लाइफ इज अंस्टेंट फाइट अ फाइट बिटवीन द एवल फोर्स एंड द डिवाइन फोर्स विद्या शक्ति एंड अविद्या शक्ति दीज टू बिलेजरेंट फोर्सेज आर एक्टिव इन द ह्यूमन माइंड अ साधका विल इनकरेज द डिवाइन फोर्स and a non sadhaka will encourage the evil force this fight is called devasura sangrama the deva party is the divine force and the asura party is the evil force this devasura sangrama has been going on since time immemorial and that's why spiritual practice spiritual sadhana is called sadhana samara sadhana is samara Samara means war, fight. We get this very picture in the Gita. In the Gita, in the first sloka, what does it say? Dhritarashtra Vacha. Dhritarashtra said, Dharma Chetre, Kuru Chetre, Samaveta, Yajasava, Mamkaha Pandavachva, Kim Kuru Vata Sanjaya. O Sanjay, now that my children, and the children of pandu have gather on the battlefield of dharma chetra of kuru chetra eager to fight what is taking place dhritarashtra said who is dhritarashtra dhrita means controlling controlling entity and rashtra means structure framework and who does control your physical structure your mind because of the mind because of the existence of the mind the structural solidarity of a body is maintained if the mind leaves the body the body will decompose dissociate its structural solidarity will be lost so who is dhritarashtra he who controls the rashtra he who controls the physical body that is the mind Dhritarashtra uvacha means the mind says the question arose in the mind in the human mind now do you know 
धृतराष्ट्राशेण संजया धर्म क्षेत्रे कुरुक्षेत्रे समवेत्ता युजोत्सव मम कह पांडवस्व किम कुरुवत संजया धृतराष्ट्रा एस्क संजया दीज टू बिलेजरेन फोर्सेज माय पार्टी एंड द पांडु पार्टी हैव एसेंबल्ड ऑन धर्म क्षेत्रा एंड कुरुक्षेत्रा टू फाइट अगेंस्ट ईच अदर एंड आफ्टर एसेंबलिंग देयर वॉट डिड दे डू संजया टेल मी नो वाई डज धृतराष्ट्र एस्क संजया बिकॉज धृतराष्ट्र कैनॉट सी द माइंड कैनॉट सी द माइंड इज अ ब्लाइंड फोर्स धृतराष्ट्र वॉज ब्लाइंड यू नो धृतराष्ट्र वॉज ब्लाइंड बिकॉज द माइंड इज ब्लाइंड द माइंड इज अ ब्लाइंड फोर्स द माइंड कैनॉट सी विदाउट द हेल्प ऑफ द कॉन्साइंस द माइंड कैनॉट सी विदाउट द हेल्प ऑफ द विवेका द मना कैनॉट सी विदाउट द हेल्प ऑफ द विवेका द मना द ब्लाइंड माइंड एस्क द विवेका द विवेका इज संजया द रिजल्ट ऑफ फाइट बिटवीन गुड एंड इविल संजया मीन्स द पावर ऑफ डिस्क्रिमिनेशन द पावर ऑफ द डिस्क्रिमिनेशन बिटवीन गुड एंड बैड इज कॉल्ड विवेका and this is sanjaya the blind mind asks sanjaya the mind asks the viveka my party this is the party of the blind mind and the pandu party after assembling on dharma kshetra kuru kshetra what did they do now who are the member of my party that is dhritarashtra's party that is who are the supporters of dhritarashtra who are the supporters of the blind mind now you know there are ten indriyas in the human body chachu karna nashika jehva twak vak pani pad payu and upastha these are the ten indriyas of the human body the ten organs of the human body five are sensory organs and five are motor organs chachu करना नशिका जिहवा त्वक आईज ईयर्स नोज टंग स्किन दीज फाइव ऑर्गेन्स आर सेंसरी ऑर्गेन एंड वक पानी पद पायु उपस्था वोकल कॉर्ड हैंड आर्म्स फिट्स लेग्स एनस जेनिटरी ऑर्गेन दीज फाइव ऑर्गेन्स आर मोटर ऑर्गेन्स देर आर टेन ऑर्गेन्स and each and every organ can function in ten direction so the agents of mind can function in ten times ten and hundred direction so dhritarashtra had 100 agents 100 sons these 100 sons were the party of dhritarashtra they are the supporters of materialism they are the evil force and pandavastva they are fighting against whom against the pandavas what is the meaning of pandava in sanskrit panda from the root word pand means spiritual knowledge sentient knowledge pandita means he who has acquired spiritual knowledge he who has acquired sentient knowledge panta means i am brahma this firm determination this stance of i brahma this firm determination is called panda and he who has acquired panda is called pandita and he who want to acquire this knowledge is called pandu and pandava means pertaining to pandu the state that you will have to go through in your spiritual practice are pandava in your spiritual sadhana you are required to exalt your कुल कुंडलिनी द कॉल सर्पंटाइन फ्रॉम द मूलाधार चक्रा टू द पीनियल ग्लैंड एंड इन दिस प्रोसेस ऑफ एग्जल्टेशन दिस कॉल सर्पंटाइन दिस कुल कुंडलिनी विल हैव टू पास थ्रू फाइव इंपॉर्टेंट फ्लैक्सी दीज फाइव इंपॉर्टेंट फ्लैक्सी आर द मूलाधार चक्रा द स्वादिष्ठान चक्रा द मणिपूर चक्रा द अनाहता चक्रा एंड द विशुद्धा चक्रा these are the five plexi controlling physicality controlling the physical world 
द मूलाधार चक्रा इज रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय सहदेवा द स्वादिष्ठान चक्रा इज रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय नकुला द मणिपुरा चक्रा इज रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय अर्जुना द अनाहता चक्रा इज रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय भीमा एंड द विशुद्धा चक्रा रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय युधिष्ठिरा अन अब दैट इज द साइड ऑफ द माइंड वॉट माइंड द सेंटियन माइंड वेन द कुल कुंडलिनी रिच इज हेयर मीट पॉइंट बिटवीन द आई ब्राउज अ पर्सन अटेंड द क्वालिफाइड स्टैंड सौ विकल्प समाधि सो टू अटेंड दिस स्टैंड ऑफ सौ विकल्प द कुल कुंडलिनी दैट इज द जीवा शक्ति द स्लीपिंग डेविनिटी विल हैव टू पास थ्रू दीज फाइव स्टेजेज सो दीज फाइव स्टेजेज आर द पंच पांडवा फाइव पांडवाज सो ऑन द वन साइड दिस कुल कुंडलिनी पासिंग थ्रू फाइव चक्राज ऑन द अदर साइड द वन हंड्रेड एजेंट्स ऑफ धृत राष्ट्र दे आर फाइटिंग अगेंस्ट इच अदर दिस फाइट इज द फाइट ऑफ साधना द साधना समारा एंड वेयर इज दिस फाइट टेकिंग प्लेस ऑन धर्म क्षेत्र कुरु क्षेत्र वॉट इज धर्म क्षेत्र योर फिजिकल बॉडी इज धर्म क्षेत्र Without this physical body, you cannot practice dharma. After leaving this physical body, you will not be able to follow dharma, to do dharma sadhana. So your physical body, this body is dharma chetra. That is, this fight is taking place within this body. And kuru chetra, kuru means in Sanskrit, do. It is the imperative mood, second person, singular number. of the root verb kra kuru means do and chetra means field kuru chetra means the field which is always saying kuru 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 do something do something do something do something chetra kuru the chetra of deeds so kuru chetra this universe is kuru chetra this world is kuru chetra and your body is dharma chetra and this war between the pandavas and the kauravas on 100 kauravas and the five pandavas is taking place within this dharma chetra and within this vast kuru chetra this fight will never come to an end in individual life when the pandavas win you will attain salvation but in collective life such a salvation will never come it will go on forever so your individual life you will do sadhana and attain salvation and with your spiritual force with your intellectual force with your physical force you are to self society you are to render selfless service to suffering humanity 10 december 1964 salem श्री श्री आनंद मूर्ति जी परमपिता बाबा की जय सीनर्स एंड दे आर रेक्टिफिकेशन अ फ्यू डेज बैक आई शेड समथिंग टू द साधका ऑफ बेंगलोर रिगार्डिंग पापा एंड पुण्य बट हेयर आई हैव बीन रिक्वेस्टेड बाय अ बॉय टू शे समथिंग रिगार्डिंग पापा एंड पुण्य सो आई एम ओवेइंग हिज ऑर्डर इट हैज बीन सेड दैट त्यज दुर्जन संसर्गम भज साधु समागम कुरु पुण्य महोरात्र स्मरा नीति मन्यत अवॉइड असोसिएशन विद द वीक्ड एंड असोसिएट विद द वर्चुअस डू गुड ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स अ डे एंड रिमेम्बर द इटर्नल कुरु पुण्य महोरात्र डू गुड ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स अ डे इट हैज बीन सेड त्यज दुर्जन संसर्गम You should keep yourself aloof from the sangha or samsarga society of durjana. You should keep yourself aloof from durjan sangha, the society of durjanas. What is durjana? Durjana means he who depraves the mind of others. Now here durjana is a relative term. A man, Mr. X, may be treated as durjana for Mr. Y. but may not be treated as durjana for mr z suppose in mr x the good portion the merit portion is 10 degrees and the bad portion 
the demerit portion is 12 degrees then the resultant is 2 degree in favor of demerit 10 degrees merit and 12 degrees demerit so the resultant goes in favor of demerit 2 degrees demerit is the resultant now another man's merit portion is 15 degrees and demerit portion 10 degrees so the resultant 5 degrees goes in favor of merit so he has 5 degrees of merit and the first man has 2 degrees of demerit so when that 5 degrees merit man comes in contact with that 2 degree demerit man the resultant will go in favor of that 5 degree merit man so that bad man will be modified rectified he will become good on coming in contact with that 5 degree merit man so for that 5 degree merit man that 2 degree demerit man is not a durjana because the latter cannot deprave him but for a man who has just 1 degree of merit that 2 degree demerit man may deprave him so for him that 2 degree demerit man is a durjana clear so tyaja durjana sansargam you should keep yourself aloof from durjanas then the question arises how these durjanas are to be rectified in such a case you should not contact the person singularly you along with two or three of your friends should contact him and those friends should have resultant merit not resultant demerit Suppose you have resultant 1 degree merit and a friend has resultant 2 degrees merit then the total should be 3 degrees merit your 1 degrees and his 2 degrees so with these 3 degrees of merit you will contact that 2 degree demerit person that person will be rectified so before your combined strength that person no longer remains a durjana but when you are singular then that man is certainly a durjana for you clear so tyaja durjana sansargam bhaja sadhu samagamam avoid association with the weak and associate with the virtuous he who accelerates the speed of social progress accelerates the speed of spiritual progress of other people is a sadhu bhaja sadhu samagamam associate with the virtuous in ancient times a commercial community caste used the title sadhu sadhu shahu shav why the intention was that by using this word sadhu this word would work as a remembrance just to remind them you will have to become a sadhu virtuous person and not a cheat you are not to cheat the public you are not to do black marketing or smuggling you are a sadhu so that commercial population used the title sadhu the change from the sadhu is sahu or sau in north india you will see this title sadhu sahu sau so bhaja sadhu samagamam you should always keep yourself in the company of sadhu people good people you should come in contact with sadhu people bhaja sadhu samagamam and kuru punya mahoratram you should do punya ahoratram and what is punyam what is punyam and what is papa kuru punya mahoratram first what is ahoratra it is part of the solar system of Indian astronomy. The solar system and the lunar system means the system calculated according to the movement of moon and the system calculated according to the movement of sun. In Kerala, the calendar is according to the Indian solar system. In Uttar Pradesh, it is according to the Indian lunar system. In Maharashtra, the Indian lunar system in Bengal and Kashmir the Indian solar system so as per the Indian solar system the solar system of Indian astronomy the period of 24 hours from one sunrise to another sunrise is called 
अहोरात्रा फ्रॉम सनराइज टू सनसेट इज कॉल्ड दीना मना एंड फ्रॉम सनसेट टू सनराइज इज कॉल्ड रात्रि मना दीना मना प्लस रात्रि मना इज अहोरात्रा सो करू पुण्य महोरात्रम यू विल हैव टू डू पुण्य अहोरात्रा वॉट इज पुण्य लॉर्ड व्यास देवा सेज अष्टशा पुराणेश व्यास वचन दयम परोपकार पुण्याय पापा पर्पिदान आउट ऑफ द एटीन पुराणा टू सेंस ऑफ व्यास आर ऑफ द एसेंस पुण्य वर्च्यू मीन्स डूइंग गुड टू अदर्स एंड पाप सेंस मीन्स डूइंग हार्म टू अदर्स वेन बाय योर एक्शन और थॉट बाय योर फिजिकल एक्टिविटी और बाय योर एक्टोप्लाज्मिक एक्टिविटी you are helping the collective progress of the society you are accelerating the progress of the society you are doing something that is punya and when you by your mental or physical action are retarding the collective progress you are committing something that is papa do you follow to go against the collective interest is papa to accelerate the speed of collective progress is punyam so papa is a general term but papa has a special meaning also what is the special meaning now regarding the difference between papa and punya i think it is quite clear regarding the special meaning of papa papa is out of two kinds in the social order there are certain vidhi and certain nishedhas certain do's and certain don'ts you should do this you should do this you should do this you should do this these are the do's of society these do's are called vidhi in sanskrit and there are certain don'ts don't steal don't do this don't do this don't do this these don'ts are called nishedha in sanskrit what if you go against the vidhis for example feed the poor serve the allying humanity these are all vidhis do this that is positive orders for example if you are to serve allying person but you are not serving allying person then you are doing against a vidhi to go against a vidhi is called pratyabhaya If you are not serving a man in distress then you are committing pratyavaya Pratyavaya is a particular nature of papa and if you do the don'ts for example do not steal is a don't it is a nishedha but you are stealing you are doing the don'ts then you are committing papa this is the special meaning of papa clear papa and pratyavaya two kinds of papa the special nature of papa is not to follow the code of nishedha not to adhere to the code of nishedha i think this word is also known here pataka and pataka is of three kinds one is pataka simple pataka another is ati pataka and the third one is maha pataka to commit an ordinary offense is pataka if one can atone for what one did that is pataka suppose a man steals suppose 5 rupees was stolen it is pataka because after that if you show desire you can repay that amount and say oh please excuse me it has been atoned for prayas chita atonement please excuse me take your money this is called pataka simple pataka but suppose you have cut off the hand of an innocent person in that case is there any scope for atonement oh take back your hand no no you cannot atone for what you did it is an unatonable offense this unatonable type of offense is called ati pataka now pataka is atonable and as soon as atonement is effected you are a free man 
but in the case of ati pataka the sastras scripture says that he who commits it it must sacrifice his life for the entire society to serve society he has no right to live in the society he is to serve society from outside this is the atonement this is the prescribed atonement for an ati pataki then the third one is mahapataka this mahapataka is also ati pataka but the difference is that its effect is of recurring nature suppose a corrupt businessman uses papaya seed in the black paper he invent a new kind of adulteration papaya seed now other businessmen will learn it from him and the process will go on in recurring nature so the particular businessman who invented this art is a mahapatiki that is its effect will be of recurring nature it will go on forever the shastra says that the proper atonement for such a mahapataka is what the first thing is that he has got no right to live in the society he must sacrifice his everything for society and serve society from outside but that is not enough that is the atonement for an ati pataki so what should he do he should invent something new and that invention should have a recurring nature of effect its effect should be of recurring nature because his misdeed has its effect of recurring nature his good deeds should also have an effect of recurring nature so this last one is mahapataka in bangalore i narrated one story the story is from the chaya ramayana in the last stage of the fight between rama and ravana when ravana was being defeated ravana was a bhakta devotee of shiva he was requesting shiva oh lord save me i am dying i am your bhakta save me save me but shiva was not helping him then parvati asked the shiva ravana is our bhakta is our devotee please help him then shiva said no i can't help him i want to help him but i can't parvati said why you can do anything anything and everything why can't you help him he is a mahapataka then parvati said no no he is an ati pataka he kidnapped sita it is an act of ati pataka not mahapataka shiva said no he is a mahapataka parvati asked oh why then shiva said to kidnap sita was an act of mahapataka but he didn't kidnap sita as a thief or as a robber he went in disguise he went in the form of a sadhu that is he created a very bad precedent and hence forward no kulbadu no lady will pay credence to what a sanyasi says they may think he may be like ravana he may also be a thief like ravana so he has set a very bad example and it will have a recurring effect on each and every lady of society so ravana is a mahapataki his action is of recurring effect so i can't help him his only atonement is if he leaves society and sacrifices his all for society so pataka ati pataka mahapataka all these three items come within the scope of papa and papa and pratyavaya and two varieties of papa in general sense not to follow vidhi is pratyavaya and not to follow nisheda is papa this is all i have to say 20 november 1965 ernakulam shri shri anand murti ji parampita baba ki jai the conduct of an acharya the behavior of the respected and elder person in society is an example 
and ideal of others it is followed and imitated by the succeeding generations as well today there is catastrophe and misery in human society and there is one reason the defective leadership of society people blindly follow even unintelligent leaders the leaders hypnotize and attract thousands with their tall talk gesture and other dramatics understand that the poverty and misery of any people in any country are the sins of the leader true leaders should always be vigilant and think how to work best for human society they must be ever cautious that under their guidance the people are not led to darkness death and immorality those who have the responsibility to show the path to others should be superlative character with the most refined conduct they and their followers must move constantly toward all around development and shreya ultimate spiritual attainment person who teach such well regulated behavior to others by their own conduct are called acharyas bear in mind that people may be harmed or misled by even a small weakness or defect in the conduct of an acharya just as it is the duty of a father to educate his children properly by his good conduct an acharya or acharya should always instruct by his or her exemplary action and words in every period of history some people are heard saying today's society is ruined the people degenerated life was better in the old days the same view is expressed in every era have human beings really lost their humanity don't they hold the highest position in the evolution of living thing on the psychological diseases of humanity are the result of not having bhuma drishti cosmic outlook in life the diseased person do not consider others but think only about themselves they are busy thinking about their own families employers etc and they forget everyone else this is a terrible malady but it is a mere expression and symptoms of narrow mindedness the real root and reason for psychological diseases the cure is to reverse the trend of behavior to rid the fallen human beings of narrow mindedness the medicine is one and only one brahma bhava ideation on supreme consciousness but just adopting the supreme goal does not immediately establish on in that it is the work of the acharya to recognize if a person is on the right or wrong path and course of action the acharya should give direction and guidance in every work big or small when he or she is to impart any duty to anyone he should be strict strong and exact like a diamond he or she should never consider social position wealth rank etc only those who are established in yama and niyama moral code and practice sadhana can be given any responsibility remember anand marg is a man making mission both quantity and quality are important everyone should be free to join anand marga to take part in social function etc but only those established in yama and niyama may be given any position to work in society just to satisfy someone and compromise with sin is unthinkable we can in no case ever compromise with injustice an employer and a worker may compromise after a struggle but anand marga is fighting for satya absolute truth and unless and until we get total victory in both individual and collective life 
वी मस्ट नॉट स्टॉप द स्ट्रगल कॉम्प्रोमाइजिंग विद इनजस्टिस ड्यूरिंग बैटल इज असत्य अनट्रूथ Achieving only 75% satya and 25% asatya is no victory. Quinine suppresses the symptoms of malaria while the disease still remains in the blood, but the disease must be destroyed. Therefore, until you banish asatya, you shall not stop your battle. Society is the collective name for those who want to move ahead together. The struggle against sin must be waged individually as well as in a well unified way in collective social life. There is a story in the Markandeya Purana. In it, the demon defeated each of the gods individually, but then the gods united all their individual strength and formed a tremendous collective force. thereby rotting and destroying the demon it is a very good story and there can be practical application of its meaning in every collective endeavor it is the duty of an acharya to develop this great collective force of society by awakening the masses to unite and destroy the evil demonic forces existing in society The struggle between good and evil forces goes on. Sound and urgent clarion call in this battlefield of life. Acharyas must give such inspiration to the people. You know, a son must remove the debt of his deceased father. He is morally bounded to do so. Similarly, you are to purify society by purging it of sin. it is more than an obligation it is your bounden duty you must do this or total destruction is inevitable to take leadership in society you must be established in yama and niyama in just such a strict way shri shri anand murti ji param pita baba ki jai there should be subjective approach through objective adjustment i must never ignore or neglect the present tense that is i must always remember where i am and what i am to do just at present but what is the present we know that there are three tenses past present and future what is the present tense what is the future tense actually There is no such thing as the present tense. When I say something, you do not then hear it. You hear it after a small gap. What is the gap? The time taken by the air to carry the sound to your ear. And when you hear, it is past for me. So when I say it, just when I am saying it, it is future for you. because you hear it after a short gap and when you hear it it is past for me then what is necessary you see even a very sensitive organ takes some time to adjust or to digest very long and very short wave that is inferences so when we find a little difference between past and future we say it is present here between my saying and your hearing there is a very little gap and human organs fail to differentiate that gap from saying the actual hearing we say it is present tense actually there is no present tense but lord shiva said you should live in present tense the actual meaning of this sentence is you should always be mentally present in the present tense that is you should never ignore or neglect the present tense what is the import human existence is physical human existence is psychic human existence is spiritual among these three the physical one is very crude the psychic one is less crude you may say more subtle and the spiritual one is the subtlest 
so this existence of the present tense is more prominent in the physical stratum than in the psychic and more prominent in the psychic than in the spiritual actually in the spiritual there is no difference among present past and future and that is why one who has established oneself in the aspect of spirituality finds no difference among past present and future and becomes sarvagya omniscient one sees everything knows everything but on the psychic level there are differences and on the physical level the differences are still more prominent here lord shiva says that in the sphere of pure physicality you should pay due respect to the physical world i say it is objective adjustment but whatever you are doing or whatever you will be doing in the physical sphere you should have proper adjustment you should maintain proper equilibrium this adjustment or equilibrium should be with your psychic stratum in the psychic stratum the existence is less crude and more subtle and because it is more subtle the time gap is less prominent physically it will make much time because one psychic structure one psychic body is more subtle than one's physical body and that is why the time gap is less prominent and our spiritual movement our spiritual progress starts from the psychic world the psychic level starting from the psychic arena and culminating in the supreme spiritual point so here the time gap is very unimportant movement is toward the supreme entity toward the spiritual goal where there is no importance of the temporal factor and no importance of the tempus a person must move from the psychic towards the supreme entity where there is no importance of time but in one's physical structure one is to do so many worldly deeds so many worldly duties one has duty concerning food duties concerning shelter duties concerning medical needs duties concerning education and so many things and in all these duties all these activities in the crude physical stratum there is a value of space and person and so on if a person wants proper advancement if a person want proper utilization of all his or her mind there must be a proper adjustment a proper equilibrium between one's physical movement and physical activities and one's psycho spiritual movement psycho spiritual advancement and psycho spiritual progress and that's why i said in human life there should be what subjective approach through objective adjustment if only the subjective approach is there and there is no objective adjustment their equilibrium will be lost the entire human society will become degraded and destroyed and if there is only physical activities and no spiritual advancement human existence will be rendered to the status of brute or plant which is not at all desirable so a spiritual aspirant must always remember the subjective approach through objective adjustment there is no alternative shri shri anand murti ji param pita baba ki jai macro propensitive equipoise and non propensitive digitatum macro propensitive equipoise is only used in reference to the macrocosm and not the microcosm propensities are the pabulum of the human mind they are its expressed sentiment the resultant of this vritti or expressed sentiment is the sanskara of the mind concerned 
संस्कारज हैव अ मोमेंटम हुज इनहेरेंट फोर्स काउजेज द यूनिट बॉडी टू प्रोपेल टू द फोर्स ऑफ मोमेंटम एक्टिवेटिंग देयर इन दिस रिएक्टिव मोमेंटम इज द कैजुअल फैक्टर फॉर ऑल द लेटर कंसिक्वेंसेज विच द यूनिट बॉडी विल हैव टू अंडरगो वन मस्ट ऑलवेज बी केयरफुल टू फॉर्म पायस मोमेंटा बट वन मस्ट ऑल्सो बी केयरफुल वाइल रेपिंग द कंसिक्वेंसेज ऑफ पास्ट रिएक्शन दैट इन दिस ड्यूरेशन नो फॉर द रिएक्टिव मोमेंटा बी क्रिएटेड द थ्री आस्पेक्ट ऑफ प्रोपेंसिटी रिजल्टेंट प्रोपेंसिटी कंसिस्ट ऑफ थ्री आस्पेक्ट फिजिकल डिजायर साइकिक अर्ज एंड स्पिरिचुअल लॉन्गिंग द लास्ट वन काउज इज नीदर अ गुड नॉर अ बैड रिएक्शन हेयर इज अ बैलेंस्ड स्टेट The propensity created by psychic urge can be either elevating or degenerating. If the tendency herein will be directed towards subtler state, the propensity will be elevating and if directed towards cruder state, it is degenerating. The propensity equipoise is a characteristic only of the macrocosmic entity. Since in it lies everything nothing is beyond or external to it hence it remains an asel but microcosms have an external world and get a cell their form due to incoming vibration to have an unbalanced state propensities are the pabulum of the unit mind it cannot exist in the absence of these propensities the microcosmic psychic body gets reflection from external physicality and thus from propensity as its pabulum thus an internal projection of the physical world is the mental pabulum nothing is external to the macrocosm everything is within it and so the macrocosm need no pabulum this is the fundamental difference between microcosm and macrocosm in addition whatever the macrocosm creates it is new while the creations of the macrocosm are mere reflection of the external physicality truly speaking therefore propensities of the macrocosm cannot be termed as propensities but as sankalpa the entire cosmos is his sankalpa there is a perpetual equilibrium in the macro propensity equipoise do activation is a continuous event comprising within all the three phases the vibrations of the macro cosmic psychic body cause creation the acoustic root of which is a due to creation or variations in creation there is clash and cohesion which result in dissociation and association of words and vyanjanas are formed the consonant of latin are different from these vyanjanas the first letter created in the macrocosmic body during the formation of vyanjanas is ka this ka is the acoustic root the universe has thus been created with acoustic root ka to serve the ka deva means to serve the entire manifestation of the cosmos that is why they who serve and look after that which has manifested in the cosmos are known as kapalika creation and emergence of omkara the vibrations of a macrocosmic psychic entity create this cosmos and this is accomplished with the help of the creative principle During the operation of the creative principle the bodhi chitta is formed in the first phase the metamorphosis of swara vowel into vyanjana is due to the operation of the creative principle when the creative principle reflects in the supreme self there is a light which is termed as effulgence this effulgence is an event both in the microcosm and the macrocosm in the microcosm this is personal effulgence and in the cosmos it is cosmic effulgence 
or Brahma Jyoti, which is omnipresent. When the spiritual aspirant is able to visualize this effulgence, he or she visualizes the universe as cosmic effulgence. When the creative principle creates a star in the transcendental entity, sound is also created, and this sound is Omkara. In Buddhist Tantra, this has been termed as Prabhaswara Sunyata. It is said to be Sunya or vacuum because herein exists no physicality and ipso facto psychic expression cannot operate and the only entity is spirituality. That is why Sankracharya said that the Sunya of Buddha is the same as Brahma, Supreme Consciousness. Non propensitive desideratum, the goal. When the microcosm moves towards the external world with the help of the creative principle, it is said to be pravritti. And when the trend is from physical to psychic and from psychic to spiritual, it is said to be nevritti. And when there is a balance, it is samriti bodhi chitta, which cannot be the goal of microcosm. The supreme desideratum is the goal of the microcosm. Microcosmic tendency is propelled either by pravritti or nevritti. It cannot be samriti. Since dynamism is inherent in the microcosmic entity, the Vedas therefore ask the human being to move on and on because dynamism is life. To one who is engrossed in spiritual darkness, it is called Kali Yuga. To one who has awakened and desired to get up, it is Dwapa Yuga. To one who has gotten up, it is Treta Yuga. And to one who has marched on the spiritual path, it is Satya Yuga. Dynamism being inherent in human nature, Samriti is not possible. One will have to adopt the path of pravritti or nivritti. The path of nivritti is non propensitive. And its last point is the non propensitive desideratum, which is the supreme goal of humanity. To achieve this, one has to withdraw the mind to the one point, and then the pointed eye shall be merged into the cosmic ocean which is the desideratum. When the merger has been accomplished, there is no need of any help from the creative principle. The effulgence expression in the bodhicitta does not exist either. There is the state of Nishchala Brahma. Everything has been merged into it, which is the supreme desideratum. He is a supreme progenitor and we are his progeny. He is the supreme desideratum. Shri Shri Ananda Murti Ji, Param Pita Baba Ki Jai. The Cosmic Inheritance and the Cosmic Desideratum The ultimate and supreme formula of unity for the human race is first, that they came from the same source, second, that they will go back to the same place from where they came, and Third, that they have the same goal in life, to merge with Brahma. There is no exception to this rule, nor is there any alternative for human beings. The Vedas also support the above, about the origin of human race. First, that all humans came from the same source. Second, that they have taken root and established themselves in the same stratum. And third, that the same source is the ultimate goal for human beings, and that source is Brahma, and he is to be known and understood. Tantra repeats the same doctrine. From one, there have originated many. That is why that one is called Brihat. Brihat is one which is very big and cannot be measured or fathomed. The Himalayas, though very big, cannot be called Brihat 
because they can be measured from the word brihat came the word brahma brahma means the entity who is brihat and one who thinks about brahma becomes brihat oneself in other words the meaning of the word brahma is to make somebody else big it is not that he is great and that is why he is brahma rather he is brahma because he has the capacity to make everybody else great now the original question why that one became many or why many came out of one source the answer is beyond the human imagination the power of imagination of human being and the capacity to think get large when internal or external projection of the human mind do not find a ground to stand on or to sustain them so an entity which remains beyond the domain of human mind cannot be understood or probed the shastras scriptures describe this helpless condition as a deficiency or failure of non attendance or non penetration that is how can the mind evaluate a thing if it cannot penetrate into an object to grasp the central idea of the object in other words what goes beyond the reach beyond the sphere of the mind and cannot be described can be compared to bliss the gyan yoga approach if happiness and sorrow are felt within the capacity of the mind they can be explained feelings of something beyond the reach of mind are a perception of something inexpressible that is why philosopher gyan yogis do not find an answer to the question why one brahma entity became many why is there no answer because all logical arguments are made within the sphere of mind that is why learned persons do not find an answer the karma yoga approach persons who are karmi practicing selfless action also try to find an answer but their capacities are also very very limited because action is nothing but the relative change of position of an object and this relative positional change is possible only when it occurs within the jurisdictions of the five fundamental factors otherwise it is difficult to bring about the change in the mental sphere a positional change does occur but to witness that change some entity must be present there to act as a witness or as a surveyor also with it there should be a temporal knowledge or factor as well as the knowledge of time so in the crude world and in the five elemental manifestation the karmi cannot find the answer to why brahma created the universe the answer is elusive in the mental sphere also because having mental activities beyond the jurisdiction of the ectoplasmic structure is not possible and also it is very difficult to move within the ectoplasmic arena so there is no answer for karmis either the bhakti yoga approach there remain now the bhaktas the devotees a devotee neither bothers about yagya ritual sacrifice nor cares about the root cause of action a bhakta does his or her job his or her duty that much and nothing more a bhakta is a simple and straight forward person who does not get involved in intricacies he or she only understands the simple things and says my lord was alone all of you understand how painful it is to live alone for years and years the same for my lord also was he not alone when there was no universe no expression no creation nobody can understand that condition nobody can give an answer what kind of situation was it unthinkable my lord was 
in that condition therefore to amuse himself he created this jagat universe to play with his children to kill his loneliness there is no other answer than this so the bhuma cosmos numerically and abundantly became many the father of the universe the one and only parampita is playing with his innumerable children remaining himself with them this is his leela sport the leela may appear painful to many and delightful to others but this leela is a great play in which everybody is playing or want to play a happy part but some must play a sorrowful part also otherwise a drama does not become interesting so in this world of his brahma is staging a big play whenever he wants he will call us nearer to him will make us merge in him this is his drama so everybody must remember to play their different parts in his drama actually nobody is miserable or wretched and nobody is blessed nobody is wise nobody is a stupid fool everyone has to play his or her part and nothing more who ever can remember this will suffer no sorrows and will not be overwhelmed with happiness either this is the cosmic inheritance or cosmic heritage everybody came from the same source nobody is inferior to others nobody is small nobody is untouchable nobody is superior in caste all are equal all our brothers and sisters coming from the same parentage originating from the same source if one believes in the caste system it means he or she does not have any faith in parampurush supreme father because children from one and the same father cannot have different caste so one who believes in parampita cannot agree with the caste system and vice versa those cunning person who created caste distinction in the past did it to serve their own vested interest from here start the circumambulation to where can one go if one emerges from that one brahma entity when there exist nothing outside the realm of brahma can he ask anybody to go out to get out of his realm can parampurush say that because he does not like so and so because that person is a scoundrel that person should be driven out where will that person go he does not reside outside of him he can never be outside of parampurush you are telling me to get out very well but tell me show me the place where i shall go and reside wherever i go i shall be within you for nothing exist beyond you if you cannot tell me or show me where i shall go then please do me a favor kindly change your name so that you do not remain omnipotent and omnipresent so that you will be a limited entity so that we can exist outside of you please change your name from infinite entity the speak chandi dasa you say that you are adinatha first lord you say that you are adinatha so where do i stand between the adi and the anadi are you not my natha also my lord so to rescue me to give me deliverance is it not your bounden duty must you not do your duty in the sphere of thinking the rule is that both centripetal and centrifugal forces act in their special respective circumstances similarly about the power of parampurush it has been said shakti sa sivasya shakti shakti the operative principle is the shakti force of shiva the cognitive principle 
if there is any power any force it is shivas and shakti act in two ways vidya and avidya centripetal and centrifugal in relation to the nucleus consciousness so you will have to agree that nothing can go beyond or can stay beyond parampurush everything is revolving around parampurush keeping him stationed in the center sometimes the radius of a thing revolving around him is a long one sometimes the radius is small there are different sanskaras mental reactive momenta for each thought human structures are also different according to the domination of their sanskaras so all creatures with all their body structures sanskaras occupations livelihoods and mentalities are revolving around brahma this movement or revolution around brahma last as long as one thinks that one and one's lord are separate entities but as soon as one thinks and understand that this is not the case that they are not separate rather one is like a drop of water in the ocean they will merge and will become one this is the rule of his creation but when does this become possible it becomes possible only when the lord showers his grace when he favors one then only does one acquire the qualification the chance and the necessary training to rush and merge into him whoever evolves this wish to merge into him parampurus in the form of sadguru brings that person up and teaches that person trains that person how to take a step to move forward towards parampurus and to merge in him the arts the rules of how to merge into brahma are also known to no one except parampurus so it is he who teaches aspirants as sadguru there is no alternative to this cosmic inheritance and cosmic desiderata so this coming and going is called cosmic inheritance and cosmic desiderata the word desiderata was used in the plural sense so i find that in the cosmological order of the universe the nucleus of brahma chakra is singular and one only there can be no two no more than one so desideratum should be the proper word and not desiderata because the aim is singular the goal is one there can be no two aims or goals one must have a one track mind to have two minds is to invite disaster to invite death to destroy oneself this originating and returning from and to brahma and remaining in the brahmic sphere in between are all leelas of brahma leelas between the little ones and the big one here the little ones should always be in mind that no matter how small one is one is a part and parcel of brahma in his or her small cranium the human being has a brain his or her gray matter by which one is able to think but how much capacity does the brain have now in special cases human beings are found to possess the memory of their previous birth which can be termed non cerebral memory but in ordinary condition human thinking is done and memory is preserved with the help of the brain within the cranium in other words the feeling are created by the nerves but what can a human being achieve with his or her small brain and gray matter in a small cranium with a bunch of nerve fibers so can the power of the human being be compared with that of vidhata the creator there cannot be any comparison nor can any comparison be thought of from his or her small brain a person draws one's little intelligence and one's little power of memory 
a person passed his MA examination 10 years ago. Ask that person a question today and he or she will in all probability fail to give a correct answer. Now the only asset that person possesses is his or her educational certificate. He or she has no other property. This is the ultimate and measurable capacity of a person who boasts of his or her great intelligence. What a strange thing to claim! Parampurus is the source of all wisdom and the seed of that wisdom. He has implanted in all the inanimate objects of his creation to enable them to develop it in proper time and to emerge as jivas, living beings. Again, these jivas become mentally transformed as their intellect develops through culture and through class and cohesion. So it is not proper for human beings to go in for argument about godly affairs because the capacities of human beings are very meager. How much, how far can a person observe with his two eyes? How far will his vision penetrate? Very little. But Brahma, in whose consciousness the whole universe is vibrating, Brahma, who can see through all the things of the universe and can read all the thought in all the hearts. Is there anything which can be concealed from him? So it is better not to have the audacity to compare the atom to Bhuma or to liken the Jiva to Parampurus. Parampurus has a thousand feet. If you want to go to Calcutta in a person, it will require time for you to reach there. But Mentally, you can land in Calcutta in no time. Now, for Brahma, in whose mind and consciousness the entire universe is created and situated, for Brahma to move from one place to another place in his own created universe does not require any time. Brahma can move anywhere, anytime, at will within a twinkling of an eye. That is why. It is said that Brahma has a thousand feet. Brahma does not have to move or shift from here and there. He has his feet planted in every nook and corner. Brahma exists everywhere. He is the omnipresent entity. Brahma is everywhere, in every pore, in every atom he exists. Not only that, he exists in the subtler expression which develops over and above the elemental entity. He exists in the psychic world and also in the central stratum of an object. He has his seat in every adhisthana, abode of a pervasive nature, where the mind is centered because the mind is being controlled from this center. Brahma also stays beyond the reach of the mind. He is out of the reach of the crude world. Salvation and emancipation depend entirely on his compassion and mercy. Human beings do not have any say or choice in the matter. Also no justification can be shouted for because the rules of justification work within the limited jurisdiction of the mind. Human beings cannot think or go beyond that limit. Brahma's seat is in the thousand petaled lotus chakra from where he controls. The distance of this chakra from the other chakra, that is from the next lower chakra, can be measured with ten fingers. That is, it has been said, Atyastha dasam gulam. Over and over this chakra, another dasam gula, ten finger width. A seat is there which is also being controlled by Brahma. So, in the universe there is nothing that Brahma does not control or cover. In you, Brahma is lying asleep. If by doing sadhana you arouse yourself, he will also be awakened. Then Jiva, unique being and Shiva, infinite consciousness will merge and become one. Param Purush knows everything. He knows all. He does not have to learn things by reading books. 
he does not have to remember he does not need to understand we learn to forget but parampurush does not what is knowing it is subjectivization of the external objectivity this is jnana prakram the means of attaining knowledge outside brahma there is nothing therefore subjectivization of the external objectivity does not arise in his case because everything is internal for him everything is based on him he is the basis of everything so he does not have to learn anything from books is it only in vaikuntha above the seven lokas where one will find brahma no brahma exists everywhere he is in vaikuntha but for that matter he is in hell also he is omnipresent there is no object in which he does not exist in order to preserve one's existence his closeness is necessary and required if a sinner laments that god is not looking at him he is making a mistake god is with everybody as soon as one will cry and shout oh god take me on your lap god will then and there take the person up on his lap rub off the dust and say come i am taking off the dust of your sins so under no circumstances should human beings think that they are staying away from parampurush because staying away from his children is against the nature of brahma i have repeatedly said that it is not befitting for anyone to say that god shows compassion on some particular persons only and not on oneself one who says this has an umbrella of ego spread over his or her head that person is receiving god's compassion all right but the compassion is not touching or drenching the person because of the barrier of that egoistic umbrella to feel the love of god throw away that umbrella of pride by doing sadhana so in conclusion what do we get the main formula is that we came from the same source we came from the same unit and that unit is param purush so between human and human no difference no distinction can be accepted acceptance of such discrimination would be like going against the wish of param purush would be to act like danavas demons such danavas should not be tolerated by human being param purush is the shelter and existence of everybody so it is the duty of human kind to utilize properly and collectively all the things that param purush has provided for human being humanity must proceed to fulfill its ultimate aim of joining with param purusha by helping each other there lies the fulfillment the gratification that is parmartha that is parma purushartha to do this to achieve this goal humans are born if one does not do this duty then one cannot be called a human being because a life without dharma is a life worse than that of an animal shri shri anand murti ji param pita baba ki jeep and inertia nidra tandra bhayam krodha alasyam dirgh sutrata sat dosha purush neha hantavya bhuti michata those who want to prosper in life must destroy these six defects in themselves nidra sleep tandra drowsiness alasya lethargy bhaya fear krodha anger and dirgh sutrata procrastination it is said those who long for their well being who very much wish for their all around development will have to give up these six bad habits a person desirous of welfare must necessarily be free from these defects otherwise 
one's progress is bound to be impeded retarded nidra sleep a person who is give to too much sleep can never perform big things in life a person who sleep too long spend half of his or her lifetime in sleep only so how will he or she find time to do novel deed human life after all is not very long and of that short span of life if half is wasted on sleep only then there will hardly be any time left for doing novel deed that's why it is said a person who is given to too much sleep can never aspire to attain the peak of progress in life sleep is necessary for health but many people wrongly think that the more one sleep the better it is for health that is wrong human being go to sleep because they want to work more while working for long period the body gets tired and then only does one take sleep just to get back fresh energy for work tandra tandra means inertness or energia for various reasons this energia develops in human being for instance in some persons this eternal grows out of a lack of self confidence before starting any work such persons think inwardly shall i be able to do it perhaps i shall not Out of this sort of hesitation or diffidence a person develops inertia the lack of mobility there are still others who lack courage who don't dare to take up any work who hesitate to take the responsibility of initiating any work this also leads to inertness again there are some people who have the capability to work who do not work due to lack of initiative they sit inactive because of lack of self confidence a person who is a victim of this sort of inertness can never attain progress in life that is why i say whenever there is a desire to do any good deed do it immediately without bring it to my notice and in case of bad deed kill time as much as you can in order to make progress in order to perform noble deeds you must give up these six defects excessive sleep indolence fear anger laziness and procrastination and then you will be strong enough to broadcast the ideas and ideals of ananda marga to the nooks and corners of the globe 14th January 1979 Barakpur Devotee is moving around the cosmic nucleus you know there is a time honored theory of cause and effect it is a recognized fact a recognized standard of veracity that wherever there is a fact there must be cause this was propounded by Maharshi Kanand He first said that where there is an effect there must be a cause we may or may not know the cause but the cause is there at the same time you should remember that wherever there is a fact there must be the cause but wherever there is cause there may or may not be an effect you see wherever you find any sprout the cause is the seed but wherever there is a seed there may or may not be a sprout that seed may lack in qualifications for creating a sprout or the seed may have had the power to create the sprout but did not create it from a bad seed from a weak seed there will not be any sprout but even if there is a very good seed but that seed does not come in contact with earth or air or water or light in that case there will not be any sprout so we must say that nothing in this universe is non casual here we have come our coming is the effect of some cause because it is the effect 
what is the cause why have we come here the theory says that it is not non casual then what is it for wherever there is a movement wherever there is a flow for a long time if it does not receive a fresh impetus what happens it loses the acceleration and finally what happens retardation starts in our human society there was want of acceleration from the very start and how the retardation has also started now humanity bleeds the future is dark so we have come here to do something i have come here to do something and you have also come here to do something my coming is significant and your coming is not less significant we have come with a mission and our lives singularly and collectively are a mission not missions our is a collective mission here we all are one we have come to do something and that is the casual factor and what will be the effect the effect will be that the world will realize the humanity is one and indivisible and no power in heaven or on earth can destroy this glorious humanity we have come here to save humanity and we will save humanity another thing we have come our coming is not non casual it is casual and you see nobody amongst us a b c x y z is what did i say insignificant each and every entity has got many a thing to do and he or she will do it and you see our fates have been very closely associated with one another this shows that in the past there has been some unity amongst us some closeness some proximity amongst us that is why we have come together it is not meaningless we must always remember this thing when a group of good people that group may be of a thousand that group may be of a million that group may also be of many billions but when the group comes it comes to do something concrete and that group is known as hari parimandal goshti because that group moves around make a circle round the cosmic ideology so you have come here to from a strong well knit hari parimandal for the coming generation 6 october 1979 kolkata the omni pertinent and omni present consciousness सूक्ष्मति सूक्ष्म कलील से मध्य विश्व से श्रश्रामनेक रूपम विश्वस्यकम परिवेष्टिराम ज्ञानत्व शिवम शांति मत्यंतमेति अनध्यानंतम खिलस्य मध्य विश्व से श्रश्रामनेक रूपम विश्वस्यकम परिवेष्टिरम ज्ञानत्व देवम मुच्यते सर्वपाशा within so many subtle and still subtler structures the creator of the universe expresses himself in so many forms by knowing him knowing that shiva who is beyond the universe also human beings can attain absolutely peace within this vast universe the creator the one without beginning or end expresses himself in so many forms by knowing that deva who is beyond the universe also human beings become free from all feathers param purush is called sukshma or subtle what is subtle any object which does not usually come within the scope of the sense organs is called subtle when an object is so small or so vast that the human eyes cannot perceive it properly it is called subtle when a particular sound is so low or so high that human ears cannot perceive it it is called sudden 
Similarly, when an object is so sweet that our tongue cannot properly perceive its sweetness, it is called subtle. So it is said that anything which does not come within the scope of sense perception is called subtle. And this subtle object, human beings try to bring within the scope of sense perception through a machine, a telescope or a microscope or something of the sort. And that object is called very, very subtle, which does not at all come within the scope of perception, even through subtle instruments. Now the difference between a subtle object and very subtle object varies from person to person, from place to place. For instance, there may be some subtle object today which is not perceivable even by machines, but maybe some new machine will be invented tomorrow by which we will be able to perceive the same object. Then that object will no longer be considered very subtle. But even in that case, there will be something, some entity, which will still remain very subtle for those days. This is the execrable law. The word Kalam has a number of meanings in the Vedic language, but the general or popular meaning of the word is Adhara, a structure, a base. What sort of a structure? A structure with which I am associated through inference. For instance, suppose a very bright light is emanating from an object. Light may be emitted from any object, but the very object which is radiating light and which you are trying to perceive, that very light radiating object is known as Kalila. Now Parampurus is manifesting himself in various forms even through that Kalila. Now comes Vishwa. Vishwa apparently means universe which is created. That which does not come within the scope of human perception but only partially. Now the degree of human comprehension of this universe varies from person to person. For a human being, this universe is certainly beyond the scope of total perception. But a certain portion of this universe is certainly within his reach. Again, to occur the world is unlimited, no doubt. But the cow fails to comprehend that this universe is unlimited and that only that part of the universe where sea grazes come within her reach. So, there is a variation between human and human and between creature and creature as to the degree of comprehension of this universe. That's why some persons spend their lives in quarrels over land, while others may prefer to spend their lifetime delving into scriptures, while others might be more interested in earning money. For these types of people, a very little portion of the universe is within their comprehension, whereas a vast portion of the universe remains untrodden and incomprehensible to them. Now human greatness or smallness is judged by how far a person has expanded his area of comprehension of the incomprehensible portion. You may find it a little difficult to understand this point. Suppose, for instance, a particular person has comprehended this earth. The solar system has come within the scope of his or her comprehension. In the case of a cow, the arena remains quite limited and if again a cow is tied to a stake, her arena may be still more limited. She does not know anything beyond that arena, nor does she want to know. She has no words to know at all. In Bengal, there is a popular saying that a cow which is tied to a fixed pole has a fixed quantity of grass to eat. Human beings who remain too preoccupied with terrestrial objects are in a condition no better than that of that cow. For a person who is more evolved in intellectual erudition, the comprehensible portion of the universe goes on increasing but the incomprehensible portion remain as large as before because that is infinite. But a developed human beings life to reclaim the incomprehensible portion. 
For instance, when we fondle a little child, we think that the child is not merely a child, but rather Parampurus himself has come to me in the form of a child just to enjoy my fonding, love and care. He has willingly come to me for that purpose. This is called Madhu Vidya and one should always remember to do it. And one who remembers to do it all the time is considered a great person in society. So this is the explanation of Vishwa, the universe, of which part comes within the scope of human knowledge while another part remains inaccessible. So the universe never means the earth only. Vishwasya srashtrama neka rupam. Now the creator of this universe is manifesting himself in innumerable form, innumerable colors. That is why a mystic of Bengal once exclaimed, Tomara rupe mugdha, ami mugdha tomara gune, par ghatate baise achi tomara name shune. This means, your beauty has delighted me beyond words. Your qualities have also delighted me beyond words. I am sitting on the other side of the river after hearing of your impending arrival. All we human beings are sitting on the other side of the river. The creator of this universe has too many forms for us to count, has too many qualities for us to count. He is endless in qualities, unfathomable in beauty. These little green worms or flies that fly about in autumn, the little red worms or insects, these long and continued seasons, these vast oceans, these roaring streams of clouds, all these are He in endless form, these rumbling of clouds, these flashes of lightning, all of existence are veritable expressions of your numerous form. You have not a few but many forms. There is no end to your form, and human beings do not have the capacities to see all your forms. You are beginningless, you are endless, you have firmly established yourself by your omnipresence by your special and supreme divine power, which human beings neither have the inherent capacity to think of, nor have been given the power to think of. If at all they start thinking about that divine power of yours, they simply lost their individual identities. None of the created beings has the power to deny your existence, to challenge your power, your qualities, and greatness. All the created beings are your partial manifestations. They can never measure you. They can never fathom you. If at all they try to measure you, that will be a sheer waste of time and energy for them. He is not only manifesting himself in this universe in various forms. He is also Parivesh realm. That is, he is beyond the arena of this universe itself, is beyond the scope of human comprehension. You are circumscribing even the vast universe you are. You are my own. You who are hidden in each and every one. You are immanent in each and every one of this universe. That immanent you who is convergent with each and every inner psychic vibration of mine. Who knows the innermost secret thoughts of my mind, even before I know who is my own? When one knows that immanent you, that Shivam, one attains lasting peace, eternal bliss. You are Shiva, you are Santa. Knowing you, one can attain bliss. Shiva means supreme consciousness. So, he who is controlling everything, is manifesting a balance in everything, who has restored order in everything. How will he restore order? How will he do so? By dint of his own prowess, own valor, 
own dignity and authority. One can attain peace by knowing Him alone. But how to restore peace? By fighting all the forces which are a detriment to peace. Now the one who can restore peace is Sankara, one who is putting everyone on the right path. By chastisement and punishment is Sankara, he is Shiva. Human beings can hope to attain everlasting peace by knowing you, who are everyone's own, who are the most favorable to one and all. Now lasting peace, that is Atyantiki Shanti, is that permanent peace which does not vanish after two or three days, peace which is everlasting, which leads to eternal well-being is Atyantiki Shanti. Only knowing that Param Purusha, that Shiva Shankara, can one attain eternal peace, there is no alternative. 7th October 1979, Kolkata